Hey, welcome to the show. Today we're going to talk about Metcalfe's Law, which is a sort of technology slash economic principle that can be useful in trying to understand the value of digital assets and currencies in the future. Hey, welcome to the show. Molly here. Today, we're going to talk about Metcalfe's Law, which is a really useful economic slash technological principle to understand when trying to look at the future of money, the future of the internet, and how we expect these things to grow. So the human mind likes to think linearly that if, you know, if I grow 10% this year and I grow 10% next year and 10% the year after, you can see this very logical, smooth trajectory of growth. But that's not how things work in every capacity. And there are some inventions, primarily around technology, that illustrate how sometimes growth is exponential, which is a lot harder to visualize in some cases. You can look at the graph. I'll show you a graph right now. But in terms of how it kind of manifests and plays out in real life, it's a little bit more complicated. So this guy, Robert Metcalf, created this principle in the 19... 90s, I think. And he was one of the founders of Ethernet. So very pivotal in the early adoption of the internet. And this principle that he defines as his own, I don't know if he named it after himself or someone else did, but it essentially talks about how adoption of a network grows exponentially. Let's use a little example. So let's say you live in a small town and you have a bunch of friends and you're the first people in your town to get cell phones. Well, when you and your friend have a cell phone, like that's cool, but you can really only talk to each other. But let's say now that three of, three of you have it. So we've added another person. Now we have this additional dimension. Not only can you call two people, but they can call each other. And let's say now we get to 10 people who have cell phones. So not only can these 10 people each call one person, all of the people can now call 10 people. So the value of this network has grown to now being worth 100 because you have 10 by 10. Let me just quickly state for you what the sort of principle is of this law. The value of a telecommunications network, however it expands beyond that, is proportional to the square of the number of connected users of the network. So if I have 10 people on a network, the value of it is 10 squared, which is 100. And so this is where this ex exponential curve idea comes up. Now, if you think about uh, digital assets and crypto and blockchain, I don't see them as different than the internet. I see it as the next logical evolution. And that in the early internet, we exchanged basic information. In web two, which is what we're in now, we saw the a complexity of communication. We started to see communities and content and transactions, so a much more sophisticated exchange of information. There was one problem, though. You couldn't exchange value, aka money. So the next iteration of the internet, which is what we're kind of emerging into now, will be an ecosystem, a network, where not only can we exchange information, we can exchange value. And when you are trying to forecast out the future price of a particular asset, it's tempting to want to sort of look for this smooth, steady growth that follows like a nice straight line, even if it's going up, it's what it's called a trend line. But according to Metcalf's law, what we're going to do is see that as adoption of a particular digital asset grows, and now all these people can use it for other things, it will increase exponentially. Specifically, it will be the number of users squared. So let's say let's we like to use XRP in this channel as an example. So let's say XRP starts to gain adoption, and now you have two people who are using it. I can send money to you. That's the end of it. Now let's move up to 10 people. So now the 10 people can send money to each other, but now I can also do things like pay my bills. I can pay my contractors who come and help at my house for things. I can, you know, buy things on the internet and like all the use cases for how people want to send value to someone else, those become part of this network effect. And then now you have me who now has come up with five use cases for it. And you have the next person who's come up with seven use cases, because maybe they do some things that are a little bit different. And you get to the point where 
it like grows almost like a virus, which is the idea of the network effect that it each sort of section of it grows on its own, amplifying out. And this is how you could see something like exponential price increases that aren't necessarily a function of the product getting better or anybody improving something. It's really this idea of a network effect and network adoption. We certainly saw this with social media, like how fun was Facebook when there was like four people on it? Not very, but then all of a sudden, you know, your circle of people that you knew in there was getting bigger. And then all of a sudden you got to the point where like every person you know probably was on it. You could swap in Twitter if you like, but the idea is that these networks become dramatically more valuable once a lot of people are on them. You kind of hit this idea of critical mass, tipping point sometimes if you want to follow Mal Malcolm Gladwell's idea that there is sort of a, a threshold that once you cross this, the growth kind of shoots up exponentially. And it very much looks like this is the trajectory for blockchain digital assets. Now we have this problem, which is why, you know, it's frustrating that this hasn't happened. And it looks very much like there has been a concerted effort on the part of some governments, including the US government, to slow down this adoption for a couple of reasons. Now, they don't like come out and tell us, so we have to speculate. It looks like the interests of some of the larger financial institutions in the country that have a tremendous amount of influence have requested this slowdown so that they can either prepare, build some tech, or just enjoy their current monopoly practices for a little bit longer. Regardless of what the motivations are, the result has been the same and that there has been a pretty concerted effort to slow down the, the adoption. And so if you don't let this critical mass hit, the network effect kind of stays very small, but there will be this tipping point when it crosses the line. And now, just like you got to the point where everyone you know probably has a cell phone, that wasn't the case in the beginning. And think about how valuable cell phones are now because I can communicate with pretty much everyone I know, if not everyone I know. And not only can I have this one use case, now that this adoption has reached this scale, all these other use cases come up, right? Now I can not only call people, I can text them, I can buy stuff, I can check the weather, I can check my stocks, I can, you know, make a to-do list. Like there's an insane amount of applications and utility within the cell phone. That's just one device, right? But it, <laughs> it's so funny, if you think, if you are old enough to remember when cell phones first started and all they did was make phone calls and maybe had like a alarm feature or some very basic thing to think about how in incredibly advanced now they're, they're some of the most sophisticated computers that people own in terms of functionality. So just think about how that evolution happened. And this a similar thing will happen with blockchain technology. We're just still at the stage where I have this basic flip Motorola flip phone that calls people and if I'm lucky, sends a really basic, boring text. And there was a point though, where it kind of felt very slow in the beginning and then boom, it like took off exponentially. The app development like pro proliferated like crazy. Now there really aren't very many things that you cannot do on a phone that you could do on a computer. They have full functionality and they're transportable. People don't really even own cameras anymore, <laughs> unless you're like a real photographer. Cell phones have absolutely replaced handheld cameras for the most part. So if you just, that's just one example of how this network effect grew exponentially. And we even got to the point where, like if I leave the house and I forgot my phone, like I know immediately and it doesn't even happen because like I my music plays on the phone and I have podcasts I'm listening on the phone. And this type of device has become so entrenched in various parts of life. Blockchain payments will do the same thing. And it's hard right now to imagine those use cases be in the same way that if you had asked me when I had my first Motorola flip phone to imagine all of the apps that I would have on my phone. Like I wouldn't have been able to do it because it wouldn't have occurred to me what was possible. This is why, so I used to work in market research for a long time and uh, we used to court and try to work with very, very large brands. And the one brand you could never get into to do market research was Apple. 
They don't believe in it. They're like, we don't really care what people think. We're going to decide for them what products to have simply because we are too visionary for the minds of regular people. Henry Ford is also famously thought to have said, you know, if I'd asked people what they wanted, I, they would have told me they wanted faster horses because it was beyond the comprehension of people in horse drawn carriage days to imagine cars. So we're sort of at this era with blockchain technology where if I asked you to list out all of the utility use cases that would lead to exponential growth, you could probably come up with some. And, you know, I talk about this stuff all day, so I could probably come up with a few, but I fully admit that there are many that it just hasn't even occurred to me yet in the same way that I had no idea I'd be able to order a car on my phone to come pick me up. We wouldn't really have taxis in the same way anymore. And if the thing would like track in an app and I could see when it was coming around the corner, which is super cool. The same thing is going to happen with blockchain technology. So the question though becomes one, will the US government and other world governments get out of our way so that we can help support the adoption of these things? And then the more challenging question is not all of the assets that currently exist are going to be the ones that have longevity. Which ones are they? What, who decides what that happened, how that happens? Is it going to be a regulatory issue or is it going to be an adoption issue? I don't have the answer to that. But I'm very confident that we're going to see a very similar trajectory for blockchain payments and money transfer and the internet of value that we saw with just the cell phone as one example. And that a tremendous number of use cases, I think are gonna be related to things like micropayments and tokenization of various assets that sounds like a cool idea now, but it's hard to imagine because we're still so early. So I just wanted to explain a little bit about the network effect, also known as Metcalf's law. And the idea is that once you hit this sort of point, the trajectory of growth becomes exponential and it has to do with the, mathematically the square of the number of users, meaning that you know if I have a hundred and I square it and then I square that, those numbers get really big really quickly. And that's when you can see astronomical increases. I'm not telling you to go out and buy anything. I'm just trying to explain the network effect in Metcalf's law. You can use this information as you choose fit. If you like the video, please like and subscribe to the channel and I will see you in the next one.